The good morning. Um, um, hello and welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm uh, Jack Klieger, president and CEO of the museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our second keynote event of today's inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival at the Museum of Jewish Heritage on our 25th anniversary year, which I think we're very proud of. The keynote is with renowned portrait photographers Martin Schiller, B.A. Van Cease, and Jonathan Alperi on their approaches to sharing the stories um, of survivors through their portraiture. Uh, we hope you'll explore the 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, meet with some of our 55, I'm sorry, 85 speakers, and get books signed at one of the 72 author signings in our main lobby and up on our second floor events hall. For those joining, joining us via live stream, there are six more keynote events today. You can find the schedule at nyjewishbookfestival.org and purchase the books at mjhnyc.org slash shop. Um, continuing on my commercial messages, um, I will hope that while you're here, we encourage you to take time to visit our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, on the main floor, and Survivors, Faces of Life, After the Holocaust, photographed by Martin Schiller on the third floor. Um, Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones installation is also worth a visit, just outside our excellent Lox Cafe on the second floor, which is open today. Um, um, with wonderful food, by the way. Um, the whole museum is open to you today, as a matter of fact, so please take advantage of it. You can also pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman Bookshop and Visitor Services. Why do I feel like I'm doing an intro for PBS? Um, our uh, books and visitor services on the main level. We're encouraging people to wear masks in the museum, and we hope you'll share feedback with us in our post-feature survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. This program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority. Um, your donations also help us to present these programs. Now let me introduce our panel's moderator, Jacqueline Martin, um, is a staff photojournalist with the Associated Press in Washington, DC. She's a board member of the Women's Photo Photojournalists of Washington, WPOW, and covering a diverse range of topics from the White House to enterprise feature projects, she has circumnavigated the globe, um, covering every Secretary of State since, including Hillary Clinton, and was the last photojournalist to have the opportunity to photograph Nelson Mandela prior to his passing. Martin's portrait series and documentary project feature uh, Jacqueline Martin's. That's a different Martin. <laughs> Jacqueline Martin's portrait series and documentaries project featuring people with Albinism in Tanzania has been exhibited at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. and in Kenya. Her work's been honored with awards from the White House, New, New Photographers Association, and uh, National Press Photographers Association as, featured in the, as well as being featured in the WPOW's annual touring exhibitions. The photographer's books, Martin Schiller, Survivors, Face to, Face, Facts of Life After the, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, Invited to Life, Finding Hope After the Holocaust uh, by B.A. Cease, and Shattered Lens, A War Photographer's True Story of Captivity and Survival in Syria are available for purchase in our lobby. In fact, we got B.A.'s book before he did. So there. That's okay. We like that. Um, Martin, B.A., and Jonathan will sign books after the event. I have a particular love of photography. I was a photographer at my college newspaper, um, but I wasn't quite as good as these guys. However, it's one of the art forms that we take tremendous pride in, uh, not only in the terms of what their creativity is, but in this institution particularly. Um, photographs, memory is so important for our institution, and we have a significant number in our collection, but we have a particular appreciation for the value, the contribution, and the work that photographers do, and these three are great examples of that. So with that, um, I'm sure um, Jacqueline will do more about their particular work, but I want to thank each of you, not only for being here, but for what you've done, and I particularly want to convey my mother's thanks 
to you, you three people. She's a 94-year-old Holocaust survivor and says, we need photographers so that we can never forget. Thank you very much. Hello. Oh, good. Um, I am a loud speaker, so if I'm blowing your ears out here, please just <laughs> warn me off. Uh, so first off, I just wanted to acknowledge if there are any survivors in the audience, um, please uh, wave and let us know. I just wanted to end perhaps on the live stream and also families of survivors. Um, I would just really, uh, I wanted to acknowledge possibly your presence and, oh good, there you go. And, uh, and thank you for bearing witness. Um, the past is also present and future and that is part of what I'm hoping we can discuss today. Uh, so we thank you. Um, it's an honor for me to be here today. The mission of the museum is so vitally important, especially given the recent uptick in anti-Semitic acts and rhetoric in the United States today. Uh, so allow me to introduce our panelists uh, in alphabetical order. So uh, uh, Jonathan Alperi's career spans over a decade, and he's here in the center. Uh, he has brought him, and his career has brought him to over 25 countries, covering 13 conflict zones uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, the South Caucasus, Europe, North America, and Central Asia. He's worked as a freelance photographer for various publications, including the Sunday Times, Le Figaro Magazine, Elle, American Photo, Afton Post in Le Monde, and the BBC. He's a photographer for Polaris Images and is working on, a pub on publishing a book about World War II. Uh, Martin Schuller is one of the world's preeminent contemporary portrait photographers. His signature style of extreme close-up portraiture has been utilized across his career, whether the subject is a celebrity like George Clooney or a Holocaust survivor, as seen in the exhibit currently at the museum, which we encourage you to take a look at if you haven't had a chance yet. Um, uh, these portraits encourage the viewer to draw comparisons uh, between his subjects, challenging a viewer's notions of celebrity, value, and honesty. His portraits are exhibited and collected internationally, as well as being in the permanent collection of the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Uh, lastly, but not least, uh, B.A. Van Sice is an award-winning author and photographic artist who's enjoyed landmark solo exhibitions at the, Creative, at the Center for Creative Photography and the Peabody Essex Museum, as well as dozens of pieces in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, the audience here may know him best from his four-year public exhibition of portraits of Holocaust survivors on the exterior of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, as well as exhibition, exhibitions at the Center for Jewish History and the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. So thank you, all three of you, for being here and uh, letting me grill you about your work. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I am going to start with BA. So um, Ian is going to run a bunch of photos of BAs. And what I would like uh, thank to, you, Ian. to start with is for each photographer, uh, starting with BA, and hold on, I got a little timer, guys, so we're not here for the rest of your lives. Let's get this going. And what I was hoping is that, um, BA, if you could sort of discuss uh, just as your photos are running, um, how you came, how, why was it important to you to cover this topic? How did you kind of just begin the, the concept? So for me, it was sort of a, a kind of a random journey. It started in a, in a strange place. Uh, in 2015, I was working for the Village Voice here in New York, and uh, I had wanted to do a, a particular story. At the time, there was a person running for president who was talking a lot about refugee stories and the idea that uh, perhaps refugees who come to this country, they're not sending their best people or that we should build a wall. And I wanted to do a story about refugees in America, what that looks like down the road. And I realized that Holocaust survivors who had largely come 75 years ago at that point uh, were a kind of an interesting cohort to explore. They'd come to this country, I, they had a whole lifetime they could look back on, and I wanted to explore what those lives in America looked like. I reached out to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I said, hey, can you help me find maybe a dozen survivors to run as a spread come next April? And they found me 37, and I photographed 37. And while I was in the middle of doing this project, my beloved Village Voice collapsed into nothingness. And the then CEO of the museum reached out and said, hey, so sorry about your beloved publication, uh, but would you be interested in doing an exhibition? I said, yes, I would. By that point, I had begun to quickly realize that meeting with, interviewing, sitting with survivors for hours, 
photographing them, having that sort of trust in their lives had become very valuable to me. I was very excited about showing it. And we did. If you've been in the museum in the last five years or so, you've seen the big black and white pictures out on the windows. I put it aside. Once I finished, I went to other projects. I started doing other things. And then in uh, early 2020, I don't know if any of you know this, but there was a pandemic, little pandemic. And I, like a lot of sort of uh, photojournalists, have always found the foundation of my, my, my life and my well-being from random places. I was mostly doing travel assignments and like 10 weddings a year, except that now all of a sudden, nobody was traveling and love was straight out. And I was essentially ruined and feeling bad for myself. And I started really coming around to thinking constantly, I mean really, truly constantly, about the survivors who I'd met in 2015. And I hadn't realized when I first uh, finished that first spate of, uh, of work how much they had inspired me and how much their strength had inspired me. And my little problems were quibbles compared to what they'd been through. And they had all found something like hope and something like surviving and something like thriving in America. When the pandemic happened, I started working like a lot of photojournalists for, uh, for Getty, doing string work, uh, little freelance gigs essentially, all around the country. And I started saddling that into the idea of, well, you know what, I'm gonna go and check on some of these survivors. And I went everywhere, and over the course of the pandemic, I met, sat, hung out with, interviewed, became friends with, ate with, was filled with cookies by, about 140 Holocaust survivors. And it was a remarkable journey, and it became an absolute sort of lodestar for strength to me that I got to share uh, time with these folks in this really, really, literally challenging environment. Uh, I was driving around getting swabbed out of my nose every two days for two years, and just being able to sit with them and then to tell their stories. And, you know, it came together once I got about halfway through that, uh, I was chatting with my poor, long-suffering agent who's in the audience, a guy named Charles Kim, and I was going to say, I think other people should get the chance to, to learn what I have learned, to experience this, this greedy sentiment of growth that I've gotten to, to take from these survivors, be inspired by them in the way I have. And so it's become bigger exhibitions and, uh, and a book. forgetting this microphone. <laughs> That's great. Um, you, you mentioned that you learned a lot from the survivors along the way. What is, um, I was just curious, have you, is there a greatest takeaway from them? Because a lot of people, and I'd love to hear this from all of you, could say, you know, this was, all, this was in the past. Um, let's focus on current issues. And, and I'm curious if what you learned uh, by speaking with them in such detail. So the, the biggest thing for me, I, I would sit with them for hours and chat with them about primarily their post-war experience. My, my conversations with most survivors start kind of where the, the big core exhibit of this museum stomps its narrative. I was interested in what happened to them after the seven to 10 year horrors that they went through. And the stories were remarkably similar. Everyone sort of came to this country or, or, or found a way and were kind of wrecked at the beginning and needed time to find a way to bring their lives forward. But looking back, I, I assume just by the crowd here that quite a few folks know Holocaust survivors, there's a certain joy that's present in, in these folks. And I, my biggest takeaway is that no matter how bad it can be, if you can keep going, if you can find the strength, you can find reasons for your invitation to life, that you can find some joys going forward. Okay, Jonathan, we're going to move on and show uh, some of your work. And basically, I want the audience to become familiar with everyone's body of work. We'll, we'll let them each discuss kind of their project, and then we'll uh, do some more pointed questions. Um, so these are Jonathan's, um, well, I, I will let you speak for yourself. <laughs> so tell us about this body of work. Um, so years ago, I, dis I embarked into um, traveling the world to photograph medium format portraits of World War II veterans. Um, so I, I, it finished a couple of years ago, and the idea was to create a historical um, piece relevant in terms of 
getting as many different nationalities as possible. So what I did is I covered both Axis and Allies soldiers. So at the end, I had about 62 different nationalities with 250 veterans. Um, the main purpose of this project, and this is how I approach all my work in war zones, is I am only here to report and to, um, as a historian in some ways. Photography is a medium to bring that these historical pieces back into the general public. And therefore, uh, the notion of emotions is something I try to not bring into my work as much as I can because when you cover a conflict or if you, for example, there are, I photographed a lot of Axis soldiers and this is the past, this is what happened, and therefore, as an outside outsider, I'm not here so much to judge or criticize what has done um, because certain things are obvious and that it's what it is. And this is also how I approach my work as a war photographer is to be able to um, distance myself from a lot of things only so I can stay sane, obviously, but also because there are always two sides to a story, a bit like in a relationship. When some people divorce, you hear one side, but you should hear the other side too. Everything is a bit more 50-50 in some ways. And um, obviously I was in the Ukraine for quite some time in the spring and you could sense that you were for or against the Ukrainians and that's not why I went to Ukraine. I went to cover both sides because that's the historical relevancy. And this project on World War II veterans is the exact same approach. Um, you, you, can, you can value that certain things that were done in the past are not acceptable today and they were wrong and so on and so forth. That's fine. But it's also, uh, you should be able to move forward as well. And I think um, the, the Jewish community has been able to do that in a very powerful sense. You can remember what's happened, the Holocaust, for example, or the Armenian genocide, all these things, and you're still able to move forward. If you have that ability and connect the two, I think you'll be successful as a people, but also you'll be successful as an individual. And unfortunately, that's not always the case, and that's, uh, I think it's a waste of time. So I had a, just give you a very clear example, I had a couple of exhibitions with this work, and I was highly criticized for bringing German World War II vets in the, they were diptychs. So I would choose an ally and an Axis soldier, put them together because they were fighting the same battle just against each other. And he was criticizing, oh, you shouldn't talk about the other side. And I said, I disagree. I think they deserve also to have their story heard because by essence, they were part of that war and that's what it was. So I think that's very important to keep this in mind, especially today where everything is highly politicized and emotional. And I think it's good to step back. Um, do you have a personal connection to World War II that made you want to pursue veterans, or was it more informed by your conflict work? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, everybody in my family fought in World War II, um, so I, I was brought up in that a little bit, hearing the stories when I was young, in the French army mostly, and then the other wars like Indochina or Algeria, and even World War I. I have a, my mother's grandfather fought in Verdun in 1916, so I grew up in that. So it only made sense for me to, to explore that further. And World War II is a fascinating, historically, period of time, which uh, it's the few times in human history where humans have taken a completely different route. There's four, six years of war, and the world just changed drastically after that. Thank you. Um, Ian, I'm going to queue up Martin's work now, please. Uh, so uh, same thing, Martin, I'd love to hear a little bit about the concept. So you have a, um, a, a well-known stylized approach to your portraiture, and I see that you continued that um, with this Holocaust piece, same as you have with celebrity portraiture. So I'd love to hear about your choices to approach this topic in that manner. Yeah, um, I came to this country from Germany. I'm born in Germany, and I worked as an assistant for Annie Leibovitz, a very well-known photographer. But I was always drawn into like coming really tight on people, photographing them close up even before um, I came here, even as a photo student back in photo school. I don't know why I've been asked that question many times, why I decide to, to photograph people that uh, close up. Um, and then after you know, starting out on my own in the mid, 
late 90s, um, you know, it's very, it's very easy to take close-up pictures because you don't have to worry about the clothes, you don't have to worry about the location. It is something that you pretty much can do anywhere. So I've photographed now for 25 years in the same style. I know it sounds slightly boring. <laughs> Luckily, I take other pictures too. But for 25 years, I've been doing these close-up portraits, trying to build a catalog of faces of our time, uh, mostly for magazines of musicians, actors, politicians. Um, but then also I find personal projects that are meaningful to me. Um, growing up in the shadows of the Second World War, uh, and you know, we talked about it in high school pretty much in every class. Um, my generation is probably the first generation where it was a big everyday topic growing up. Uh, my parents' generation was too close to it. Uh, it was my grandparents' um, generation that committed uh, these horrendous crimes. And um, so we were hit in full force. We read Anne Frank, of course, uh, in, in English class, in French class, in German, in history classes. It was all about the Second World War. And um, to this day, I have a hard time understanding how this was possible, how people are able to commit such horrendous murders. And, um, and you know, the, mentally, it's really, I think, unfathomable. And. Um, I didn't know how, you know, Holocaust survivors have been photographed so many times. You know, it's like one of the oldest projects that you can imagine. You know, it's like twins. Every photographer like, feels like twins are like in the Holocaust survivors. So it is not a topic that is like new or different or very innovative. Of course, it is very important. Um, but it wasn't on my radar for a long time. But a friend of mine said, uh, he is, works for, as a chairman of Friends of Yad Vashem Germany. Um, and he said one night, we're sitting in a bar at two o'clock in the morning, a little bit drunk, and he said, you know, it's 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz is coming up. And I love your close-up portraits. Do you think you could do them of Holocaust survivors? And I said, yes, of course, why not? It would be great. So he found an um, a, a electricity conglomerate that used to have a mining operations back in, during the World War II era where they had forced laborers and they tried to you know, show the world that they have bettered themselves by supporting our projects. So I, in the end, I did it for free. I didn't get paid, but the, the costs were covered of uh, traveling to Israel and meeting and photographing all these people. And um, yeah, we put a show together that opened then on the, not quite on the 27th of January because the survivors from Yad Vashem had to be back and the staff of Yad Vashem had to be back at Yad Vashem um, for their uh, memorial events. But uh, two days before, Angela Merkel flew in on the helicopter and opened the show for me. So it was like kind of the perfect storm. It got a lot of media attention in Germany. Just the sheer number. Um, of portraits that Angela Merkel opened the show, and you know, and considering anti-Semitism is coming back so strong and so so prevalent in every society, especially in Europe, uh, you know, the work is just as important now than it was 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Thank you so much. Um, I have some specific questions for each of you. But I'm gonna um, before I get into that, I really want to show you uh, the audience. We have a couple sort of behind the scenes photos. Uh, let's see if this clicker will work. Hold up. No? Oh, wait, no, that's the back one. Last one. Okay, so um, this is a picture of Martin at work, and I think it's really striking how physically close you are to um, the people that you're photographing. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process here? And I have one more, I think. Of, yeah, there we are. So we sort of have this one. You yeah, guys can see um, how close he is, and then the second one here. With And the other thing I was curious, besides the distance, you have like a whole team here with you. Yeah, there's a um, behind the scene video, a 60 minute long video that you can see upstairs on the third floor that shows the whole process. Um, it was important to me, and it is more and more important to me to also interview people I photograph to, tell, to help tell their story. Oftentimes the face alone doesn't, you know, it's maybe a nice picture to look at, but I, I'm more and more curious. I see myself more and more as a storyteller than just the photographer. So I wanted to interview some of the um, survivors in Jerusalem, but what I realized is that Yad Vashem was very controlling of who I would be interviewing. And later I, I realized because these people, some of them are, you know, they're all older, 
but there's always a danger that if you interview them, they get a date mixed up, or they get an SS uh, officer's name wrong, or they get like one detail wrong and it's public, uh, it becomes public. Uh, then also these, these Holocaust deniers will like zoom in on that one fact that yeah. somebody got wrong, and all of a sudden um, that's another proof that the whole thing never happened. So they really picked five people for me to talk to that they felt were uh, you know, mentally clear and uh, to give their testimony because they never know where this footage will end up, where the interviews are gonna end up. But um, as soon as the first person sat down, they started telling me their life story. And so many of them even in German, which was very surprising to me. I, I learned that Germany was kind of the land where the Jews in, in, in Europe wanted to live in, in the 30s, you know, before the 30s and the 20s. It was the country where Jews were the most integrated. They could become doctors, politicians, mayors of, of towns. Um, they could get an education. So even a lot of survivors from Poland or Hungary, Romania, uh, even spoke German to me so many years later. It was quite, quite shocking. And then at Yad Vashem, nobody speaks German. Right, so right. soon everything was out of control. And, um, and yeah, it was uh, very intense. You know, the mm -hmm. first night I was out with my, with my team and you're sitting around the dinner table and there's nothing you can say. You know, there's, after hearing these stories, there's, just nothing feels like important enough to even mention, you know, we just sat there quietly and um, uh, yeah, it was a, a life-changing experience meeting all these people and hearing their stories. Thank you. Um, next we have a picture uh, that shows, this is uh, kind of a, this is a picture from BA's project, um, but it kind of helps you, the audience, see a little bit more of the behind the scenes. It's a little bit dark. BA, could you explain a little bit about your approach and your setup? Um, it's a little bit darker on the screen than it is in real life. That's okay. Uh, so this is actually not a behind the scenes. It's actually one of the portraits. Uh, it's of a person who may be familiar to a lot of you. It's Rabbi Arthur Schneier, who's at the Parkey Synagogue. And I had wanted to show in two different portraits that are in the project uh, sort of the spaces that people occupy. I got about, and by the way, you forgive me, I'm very envious of you that you had the foresight of this. Uh, I about, got about 30 portraits into doing this project and realized that it had bothered me that I didn't include as much of their environments. Environment can be often very important to a person's life and tells you a lot about them. Uh, I realized that I wanted to show some of the spaces these folks occupy. And if you'll pardon the expression, Rabbi Schneier occupies a real cathedral in a certain way. It's an incredible space, it's beautiful, it's large. And I had known that I wanted to show that off without uh, sort of sacrificing what had been this visual thematic of the corpus of the work. And so I figured it'd be fun to make fun of myself a little bit. Here's my crummy little setup, which is intentionally crummy. Here's my poor little assistant, who is intentionally masked and hiding in the side there. And here's the actual magnificent space we're occupying. So I wanted to sort of make fun of myself a little bit. The, the paired portrait of this, by the way, is a, an incredible and unbelievable survivor out in California named Sam Silberberg, who made me hike, made me and my assistant hike two miles down to the sea so he could stand in the Pacific for his portrait. It's the same kind of thing. Black backdrop, my poor assistant holding it while he's being hit by waves with Sam standing in front of it. But I did want to show that space. I, the one thing I want to point out is that the, the, the setup is intentionally uh, a little bit less than, and it, for a reason, something that Martin touched on. Uh, I phased it out pretty early on, but at the, at the beginning of the project, I had a very, very elaborate, sophisticated setup. And a few of the very first survivors that I photographed had a little bit of cognitive decline. And I noticed they get spooked by having panels and lights and setups and these big giant things flashing. So I purposely came up with a fairly simple setup to try and replicate essentially window lighting. So everybody is just a black backdrop, usually almost always in their homes, uh, with what's called the thing that Massimo is holding is called a beauty dish. And so we could make it portable, you could just put a flash in the beauty dish. The beauty dish works through a honeycomb, for those of you who aren't photographers, does what it says. It makes everyone look a little softer, a little nicer. Uh, but it's fairly simple. 
So I just have a couple, I've oh, yes. pulled a couple images up here so you can right, right. see the different approaches. Um, and I have a couple of questions for BA. So your, your images in this series are very surprising, even playful. And um, historically, images of survivors of horror, not just the Holocaust, but any kind of horrific event, um, can be bleak or, or sad. And so I'd love to hear more about why you chose this playful um, way of picturing Holocaust survivors. So. Okay, I know this is a panel talk and I'm supposed to give like short little pull quotes. Will you all forgive me if I give a complicated and nuanced answer? Uh, so there's, there's two parts to this. The first is, uh, no matter what anybody tells you, a portraitist is also making a portrait of the portraitist. The person who makes the image is always present in the image. And I hate to tell secrets, I'm a fanciful guy. Uh, and so there's part of that that's always going to be in the work because the person who makes the work is in the work. That's the, that's the short answer. The longer answer is uh, back in April, I was having a conversation with, uh, actually I don't know her last name, Revital Yakin, I guess is her last name, uh, who runs, or one of the people who runs uh, March of the Living. And she asked me, how'd you get into this? And I started telling her, well, I started, yeah, the same story you just all heard, it was making portraits, did a few, and then she stopped me and said, and you fell in love, right? And I said, yes, I did. And there's a reality to doing this work. I get more emotional about this work, and I've done a lot of big projects. I, I get very emotional about this particularly uh, because it, it does transcend expectations. Uh, talking with these folks about their lives, talking about who they've become from this horrible foundation, I wanted to show that. A lot of survivors, not all, a lot of survivors are very joyful. There is no way around that. A lot of survivors take tremendous pleasure in the simple pleasures that life has found for them or that they themselves have earned. And I wanted to show that, which is something that people don't usually do. Most people, when they talk about folks who've been through the Holocaust, they want to talk about victims, and they are. But I also want to talk about survivors, which they also are. So part of my question was really, you know, is it fair to be so light with such a dark topic? I, I feel like you kind of hit that. Um, do you want to hit so, that? Yeah, so, so, so something else that, that uh, Martin had touched on, we're not the first people to do this. And there's, there's been a lot of conversations about what survivors look like and showing that pain. I actually photographed uh, a, a survivor who's a photographer down in Florida named Lajlo Selly, who makes a point to make photographs where you can see some of that pain in their lives. Mm -hmm. It is always going to be part of their lives. Everyone has trauma. You live with it, you try and process it, you try and build something else, but it is always present, right? So that's, that's something that's always there. But the spirit of fairness requires you to also talk about all the other things as well. The story isn't just what happened to the people, it is also the people. Um. Martin, I was very curious. I was um, walking through the museum, and there is a section of the museum that has um, prisoner photos of children uh, at Auschwitz, and it's like a very spare approach. I mean, it's just they're doing headshots of people as they're coming in, um, and it. It, because they're you know point blank looking at the camera and there's like a there's no neutral there's no background there's no context it actually reminded me a little bit of the aesthetic that we're seeing in your images had you seen those images before no 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 are they more like a port, like passport pictures it, it's kind of like the and they're on the if anyone's curious these are on the second floor um, towards the back of the exhibit and it's um, it just really struck me because of the lack of context um, and which with, with your work it's like in you have a face and a face and a face and a face and it lets you contrast those things the thing I, the reason I want to bring it up I found it really interesting so those images you can see upstairs are of, of uh, people the intended victims of the Nazis um, at the beginning of their journey through this horror and then Martin's photos are of these people later in their lives um, having had a chance to reflect, and um, you haven't seen them, so it's not totally a fair question, but I, I would love to, um, do you think there's something about 
how one might reflect on being through that and, and does that show in your, in your work that it's the end, not right as the thing has happened but at the end, towards the end of their lives? Well, you know, I, I always try to raise a question with my pictures. What can you really tell from looking at a face? Can you really judge a person if you reduce a portrait just really to, to a very neutral expression and just seeing the face? And I'm not sure that you, you know, that you can, re that a portrait is really that revealing uh, in the end. You know, I, I always feel we, we gravitate more, we feel like a, a portrait is more honest if people look serious. You know, if somebody's laughing, we always feel like it doesn't, it doesn't capture the soul. You know, uh, many photographers have been called soul catchers, and I, I kind of hate that term because, you know, every photographer reduces a person down to a split second and it's, uh, we're not objective, you know, you, we edit the film, we choose a certain kind of lighting. So it is something very personal, the moment we choose, there is no objective photography. Um, and um, I think I got also, it's, it was very interesting now to photograph these Holocaust survivors so long after the Holocaust because, you know, these weathered faces, uh, older faces are always better to photograph. They have, they have more life in them, you know, you see, uh, the wrinkles and you feel that there's more to discover in a face, uh, in an old face. So they almost feel like they're telling the story and the suffering of the Holocaust more visually because they're older faces. Um, but then, you know, it's been 75 years since the end of the war. So these people have lived 75 years. So to say, now I see the horror in this uh, old man's face feels a little bit, you know, I don't know if, it's, uh, if that's really true. Mm -hmm. Um, I leave it up to the people looking at the pictures. I, I think for me it's more the fact that these people are still here so many years later that they were able to survive. And uh, what they all have in common is the sense of being able to forgive. You know, I was welcomed in uh, Jerusalem. I was a little bit worried being a German coming to, to meet all these Holocaust survivors. There would be awkward situations, awkward moments, but um, they were so friendly and so um, open, and I think that's what brings them together, that they're still here, that they're not bitter, that they've been able to move on from these, these horrors. I'm gonna um, zip back through so we can ask Jonathan a question, and I wanna save a few minutes for um, the audience to ask questions as well. Uh, so let's see while I zip back through here. And actually, watch how interesting it is actually to look at Martin's pictures really quickly. I just think they're very fascinating in a quick sequence like that. Um, but let me get back to Jonathan's here. Which... I actually have a quick technical question for Marta that I'm curious about. Do you do okay. measurements to get the eye levels always kind of the same place, or is it just you eyeball it? No, I, I, I said once in an interview, when I very first started out, I forgot with an uh, 8 by 10 inch camera with a large with format camera. camera. And there I measured and tried to really like be as neutral, and, and I tried really to attempt it what I call like objective photography, but no, I don't do that anymore. Uh, so Jonathan, contrasting your work with the other two panelists, you're the only person that included some of the environment um, in the photographs. And I'd love to hear about that choice. And was that a collaboration with the people that you're photographing um, or just like discuss that? Was that partially because of the people? Was that your approach? And um, yeah, I'd love to hear the environmental. Um, it being, the environment being included? So I, when, when I did this project, and it was very difficult because I had to locate them, get permissions, and I went through different process in order to, to locate uh, some of these veterans. Some nationalities were very easy to get, others were very difficult, so it depends. Um, and I made a point to photograph them inside their homes. Uh, the idea was to connect their past, so some of them had uniforms, and obviously they were interviewed, each one of them. And uh, this guy, I think, was Austrian. But he thought this, oh, nice. this guy was Armenian. Oh, do, you want me to go do you want yeah. to go forward? No, we, we, we can, if you want. Um, so yeah, this guy's Armenian. I photographed him in Armenia when I was covering the war there last time. And uh, he came out naturally with his uniform and all his medals, all the battles he's been in. And because in the Russian army at the time, every time there was a battle, they would give a medal. So each battle had a medal. <laughs> so that's why oh. they have such an armor of it. And Did um, you have to ask him to bring, like, did you ask him in the interview yeah. process if he had things from the war? Yeah, yeah, so some did, others didn't. So some had photographs, others had uniforms. Um, and I would always make a point to have 
between their historical past and the, what they've become as old men, as we say, old soldiers fade away, which is very true. Uh, they were very frail for a lot of them, and they were also survivors, surviving the Red Army, and at the Russian front was a feast by itself. And um, so I tried to connect the two. I also only used natural light. I didn't use any equipment, only an old Rolecord 1956 medium format camera, and that's it. And all film, I wanted to, that to be as simple, as natural as possible, as I didn't want to intervene in any way in their in their past or their present. So again, like I said earlier today, my purpose is to bring back historical relevancies, and that's it. And then others can be the judge of it. Um, I'd like all three of you, if we could all just have a little discussion here, and then I think I'll open it up for questions. I'm just really curious about, um, so all, all of your work focuses on an issue from the past told through the present tense. Um, and I'm really curious if any of you have thoughts on how the past informs the present, which can inform the future. And do you see that, do you see relevancy for that in your work? I mean, the, there's the old canard that the past isn't really past. Uh, I, the two part answer to this is I, a lot of these survivors who I photographed, they brought their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids along who hear these stories, who know these stories, who carry these stories forward and these stories are certainly present in their lives. But the reality is, is that history echoes. Nobody who's sitting in this room is unaware of what's been going on in the last what, two months now in America, which happened two years before that and two years before that and everywhere in the world at all times. And the, there's a reality that these stories always repeat, but we do have the opportunity to learn from the way they went the first time and second and third and fourth. I just want to uh, bounce back a bit on what you're saying about history repeats itself. I think it's that expression is being used, and it's tricky. I, I would rather say that history stutters, and mostly because you, what could anything that could happen will happen, and to be surprised with anything that's happening in t today's world, I think is wishful thinking because when you, I hear people tell me, oh, the, the war in the Ukraine, uh, it's conventional war, it's intense, and in the 21st century that shouldn't happen, and I say, why not? Like, what, what, what does it make you think that anything, maybe another genocide will happen, maybe something else, and so on and so forth, anything is on the table, and therefore uh, you could prepare yourself for it or you can, but at least it's important to remember that um, if there's a lesson that history teaches us, if you're curious about the past, is that anything can still happen in the future. And I think that's important to, to keep this in mind. And therefore, uh, and I agree with you, to have a historical understanding and knowledge of things that happened in the past is such an asset above anyone else who might disagree, who might not know anything about the past or no interest, that really gives you the edge and that's something important to remember. Yeah, I mean, it is shocking considering there's so many institutions dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust that there is anti-Semitism coming back, you know? It, it makes you wonder, there's been so many photographs of wars, uh, why are wars still happening? Haven't we all learned our lesson as humans? Um, like John said, you know, Jonathan said, we need to keep keep on reminding people of what these events look like in, in hopes that things will get better. But sometimes you wonder uh, what it takes for humans to, to move beyond uh, these, these terrible things. I don't know. Um, we have, I think, maybe 15 minutes left. Um, I have some extra questions, but I'd love for the audience to have an opportunity. So let's, uh, let's mix it up here. And if, if we end up with a pause, I'll throw some more at you. So do we have microphones for the audience? Uh, there in the sweater there. Hi. First of all, thank you all for the, the wonderful work that, that you do. And um, beautiful. I, I have a question or a comment for, for you, Martin. Um, and it's wonderful that you've been able to connect with the Holocaust survivors as you have. My, my father was born in Berlin. He survived Auschwitz, uh, death marches, the whole thing. He was similar to those that you met, that he did not harbor hate. He was joyous. He loved, I don't know how, but, but he was. The, the one comment that, that you made is that um, 
you felt that these people forget, forget, forgive. And the way I see it is that my father did not let hate consume him every day of his life. He did not fault today's generation for the sins of the countrymen from years past, but that does not mean that he forgave. And um, in, in, as I understand Jewish law, you can only forgive someone who comes and asks for forgiveness. Um, that certainly was not the case. So there, there, to me, there's a big difference between not letting hate consume you and living life full, but not forgiving. Thank you for that comment. That's really impactful. Um, we have one way in the back there on the balcony area, right? Oh, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a question that I missed? Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> um, hi. Um, just I had, had a point too, but I'm just it's trying to figure out how to word it. So I'm wondering what your definition of a survivor would entail, because my grandparents were never in the camps, but both my grandparents lived in the former USSR in what is modern day Kiev, Ukraine. And so both my, my grandmothers told me about traveling to Kazakhstan, like getting out of the country so that they wouldn't be killed. And my paternal grandmother mentioned how when she returned back home, she didn't have her home to return to. Someone had occupied her home and they wouldn't let her back into her apartment. So she was essentially back, kind of a vagabond. She was lost and I'm just wondering like, for some people, maybe they wouldn't consider her a survivor, but I kind of consider every Jew that lived in Eastern Europe at the time of World War II a survivor, so I'm wondering your thoughts on that. The, the question was, how do you define a Holocaust survivor? And uh, so I, I can tell you sort of two, again, sorry for all the two answers, but I defined it for the purpose of my project as anybody who was uh, a camp survivor, et cetera, of any background, because not all of my survivors were Jewish, uh, or any Jew who was living in what became occupied Europe in, between 1938 and 1945. So for instance, your family would be considered because they fled to, you said, you said Kazakhstan? Yeah. And so I would personally consider them. The, the general consensus of how survivors are defined has changed over time, but the reality is if you leave your home, go into hiding, come back to a home that doesn't welcome you, have to start a whole new life, find out your family is missing, then yeah, you've survived. Um, I'd so again, rebounds to what you said. Um, it's very important today to understand the genesis of words and what they actually mean, and I agree with him. There are certain notions in terms of what is a survivor, so originally a survivor is someone who survives death, whether it's from a holocaust, anything, could be a, a cancer, anything like that. These words, and we were talking about this in the bag before this started, and like many other words are being used willy-nilly without true meaning of what they ac it actually means. And I think that's important to keep this in mind because words mean something and they have a genesis and they have a past and a history and these words need to be used appropriately. And sometimes you hear, I'm a survivor, I have PTSD, and this, but you're not a survivor, you don't have PTSD, you just use it. But that's not right for the people who were survivors who have problems for this and that reason. So I just wanna convey that part that I, I hear people use words the wrong way all the time, and that's a problem. I have a question from the audience. Okay. I'm the audience. Oh, excellent. I am curious, uh, Jonathan, uh, just listening to what you're saying right now, you've been through war. You've been to combat, and I'm curious how you feel that affects uh, your work, your work with survivors, with veterans, et cetera, if you think that changes your, your outlook on the world. So I, I don't consider myself a survivor, even though technically I am, but I, I try to personally step away from these emotions and maybe when I'm an old man, maybe I'll, I'll come back to it and, uh, and make my peace with it. Um, the thing about war, I mean, I've been covering wars for 20 years and uh, there's, I, like I was saying earlier, it's, it's been crucial for me to try to step back again and not being emotional about what I see. Otherwise, I would have shot myself a long time ago. And you see terrible things all the time, and you have to understand that the value of human nature, is, that's part of it. 
and whether it's through terrible behaviors, you know, killing, but you also see great things. And that the nature of war itself, it's very pure because it, you see very quickly who has courage, who doesn't, who decides to survive and to move on and who gives up, who does some, a, a war crime and who saves people. That cuts right through very quickly and you can tell. And that is a great redeemer of human emotions. Uh, in term, anthropologically, in what we are as individuals and as a race, as a human race. And um, war has been very beneficial. And the one thing, and I'll finish with this, that's been very good uh, for me individually, is anything that's happened to me over the years, I mean, I was injured twice, I was kidnapped, I've seen terrible things for a long time. Everything over the years, I was able to take these elements and bring them home and understand that you can make good of anything. That's exactly what you were saying about, and you too, about these Holocaust survivors who went through something that none of us will ever comprehend. You cannot understand what it was like unless you live it. Same with war. And you can try to understand and you want to get closer to it, that's, that's what you should do, but you cannot truly grasp the nature of that experience. And therefore, um, it's, uh, it's crucial to, uh, to keep all this in mind. Oh, uh, we have one in the, the fourth row back here. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, what's the conversation like? What's the conversation like when you approach one of these survivors? Like the question, does the question come back from them? Is what do you want from me? What, this isn't my whole identity or what do you want me to, what are you looking for? for it's different than an oral history when you're asking a direct question about their experience. Um, is it for anyone in particular or just the panel? Just the panel. Anyone? Oh, I'll start. Yeah. So I think it's gonna be a bit different for each of us. Martin, yours were all arranged by one museum, right? They're all, yeah, they were yeah. all yeah. So I, I had a very different experience. Martin got the easier deal, the museum put it all together for him, and that's actually not, that's not bad logistically. Uh, I, had, I had, sorry, math, I have an art degree. I had went worked through 11 different museums uh, across the United States who helped me find survivors, this being one of them, this being the first of them, by the way. And for me, what happened was the museums would say, especially during the pandemic, here's a list of the survivors that we work with. Uh, you're welcome to try and get a hold of them. They're all going to say, no, I don't know if you're aware, there's a pandemic on, you're a yutz. And then I would contact all of them and they'd say, of course, when can you come by? Uh, I asked, so I'm going to tell you, I photographed 140. I'm going to say I asked 142 people. I only got two no's. Uh, one, by the way, is Dr. Ruth, who's coming today. Time to finally. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, so for, in my, from my experience, uh, what would happen with me was that I would tell them I want to make a portrait of them, sit down with them. My interviews usually last three or four hours, talking about their lives mostly. And everyone was absolutely excited to be able to tell their stories. Elie Wiesel said, if you, if, you, uh, if, if you listen to a witness, you become a witness, right? And so they wanted to share those stories. Where it would sometimes go a little sideways was when they realized that I also want to talk about after the war about trying to put rudders back on their ship. And that, that's where I would occasionally get a little bit of static. Uh, it would always work out in the end because fundamentally, people want their stories to be known. Fundamentally, these stories are inspiring. And once they got that, in spite of the fact that I look like a cartoon character and I'm in their house, that I, I fundamentally am also there to help tell their stories. And so there was generally an enthusiasm about it. Uh, I, I had this young woman in the front. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm afraid we're going to run out of time, and I called on her before. Just Getting your grab, steps, Gia. Grab the mic there. Or just speak up. It's fine, too. That's not gonna and then we'll come right back to I'm you. I'm incapable of speaking up. It's, like, not a thing I can do. Um, no, funnily enough, you actually, like, kind of vaguely answered some of my questions just now, which um, was that, you know, oh, I don't know. This is freaking me out. Um, you kind of, like, talked a bit about the things that you got out of it. I think with the Holocaust, it's one of these things that is used so much in so many different types of media, is talked so much about in pop culture that it's very, very heavily diminished. I think 
Um, people reference it and joke about it all the time without actually understanding the gravity, considering most people that you walk up to on the street are gonna know what the Holocaust is, but if you ask them any details, they would absolutely have no idea. Um, I guess background really quickly. I, um, I specialize in Jewish history specifically and how like anti-Semitism is portrayed in media. I'm sorry, we're having trouble hearing I you. Talk Hold the mic closer yeah. and okay. talk slower. Talking slower, okay, or, gotcha. what, what is the, just like summit? Can, yes, yeah. so the summary is basically just um, the way in which Jews and anti-Semitism are portrayed in media, like film, photography, whatever. Um, very often it is mm, portrayed very negatively or used as just kind of the pop cultural element. So I guess my question was mostly, um, when you are approaching this, this type of subject, um, obviously there's things that you get out of it, but what is it that you think that you're doing for them? Like what, um, I think you know you're taking on the task of, as you kind of mentioned, telling someone else's story. So like. Uh, I, I think I understand. Uh, number one, um, the photography, anything, visual, like you said earlier, is a portion of the truth. It's not ever the complete truth. You can get close to it, but the very idea of being 100% within truth does not exist. You, we interpret things. You take a photograph, it's framed, you have that frame, but you don't see what's happening around outside that frame because it's not in the picture. That alone, photography is not a complete truth. It's a partial lie. You're, showing to others what... So the same is true about the other part of the question regarding are we representing the Holocaust well, or the survivors, and that's what I was saying earlier. It's only truth if you're inside their heads and you're them and you know what you went through and experienced, then you know. The rest is just um, an interpretation of their experience. And sometimes they're poorly made and sometimes they're very well made, like we, these two individuals here. So, but again, it's just a fraction and it's not a complete overall view. It's part of that truth, but you need to step further back and try to do the most you can to, to bring all the pieces together. Also, I, I heard part of your question was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I had trouble hearing you. Uh, part of your question was, what's in it for them? What's, what? Oh, okay, cool, I got the mic of doom, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, my question was, you know, you talked about it being, and I think a lot of people that do this type of stuff, it being this rewarding experience, and obviously, you know, you get a career, and it's featured in museums and things like that. Um, I don't know how to word this without sounding kind of rude, so don't take it this way, of, you know, you're kind of profiting off of, you know, the trauma of other people, and so what is it that you're hoping to be giving them by sharing the stories or taking these photographs? in the least rude way possible. You're, you're, that. Concerned that, you're concerned that a traumatized population could be re-traumatized through the work? No, I didn't. It's okay, we can take it. I mean, they can take it. <laughs> I just need someone to repeat the question. Yeah, we're just, we're, I'm sorry, we're, we're unclear on it. I'm having a very hard time hearing you. I'm sorry about that. That um, she uh, is wondering, because you're profiting off of, she says that you're pro if you're profiting off of this, how does it benefit the people that you're photographing? So if I'm profiting, I'll share this fact. I'm $20,000 in debt on this project. So, uh, um, but so the, the, there's a reality to this. I don't think if you asked any of these people, uh, I, I think that they would want their stories to be forgotten. And fundamentally, if you're doing exhibitions, if you're doing projects, et cetera, that get seen by people, you're telling those stories. And so I don't think there's a single person in here who would really like to see it happen again, who wants their grandkids to know the fear that they knew, who doesn't want the greater public to be aware of what happened to them. So that's, that's sort of where the net benefit is. Um, I, I didn't do work on this topic, but I will say like, I feel like journalists in general, photojournalists in particular, the whole idea is that you are not, um, you're not, you're not um, the person, right? It's not your story to tell, but it's yours. It's you are there to help amplify that person's story, and that is part of the mission of of what I think we all we all do. Yes. And this will oh. be, have to be our last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we do him and also the, the lady in the hat? I feel bad. We we, we were on you, and then we okay. we forgot about. We'll you. start. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you grab her? Yeah. 
And then if there's time, we'll, we'll do that too. Thanks, that's why I wear the white hat. Um, I do have a question, I'm sorry I missed the first 15 minutes or so. Um, there's so much focus on the survivors, which is ultimately very important. Um, but I was wondering what the, uh, um, the sort of the communication was with their families, because there's a lot of so-called generational trauma that gets passed on, uh, which even grandchildren and maybe great-grandchildren yeah. will feel. So um, uh, I, I found it very interesting meeting these survivors. That some of them have never told stories to their own kids. You know, I, I met a broad spectrum. Some survivors decided that they want to let their kids know what happened what their childhood was like, what the experience was like uh, during the Holocaust, and others literally sat down in front of me. They have never given testimony. They never shared any stories, and then started telling me part of their, uh, part of their experiences, a couple of stories, and the kids were in shock because they never even heard it themselves, and the people at Yad Vashem never heard their story. So it's a, a wide spectrum. I think a lot of survivors felt like they don't want to share their stories, to not burden their kids. Uh, with the past, uh, and while others felt like the more they share, the, um, they, uh, the better they feel themselves about it, and the more uh, it's important to educate people what it was like. Um, so I met both, both sides. Um, Bia, it's done, you did a lot of extensive interviewing, so, so maybe you have a... So uh, I'll try and be brief, because I can feel Gabriel working around with a hook. <laughs> uh, so I had a lot of, uh, intentionally so, I had a lot of kids, grandkids, great-grandkids come. And there absolutely, uh, no one could convince me otherwise, there is a sense of what's called epigenetic memory. The, you can feel it, just both experiential, most of this, the second generation, the kids, uh, had grown up at a time when folks were still trying to figure out how they were gonna try and live their lives and try and move past what had happened to them. Uh, and the grandkids tended to take a, it's not quite right, I'm gonna call it a more academic approach, uh, interest without necessarily feeling, feeling exactly the trauma, but understanding it. I had the exact same thing that Martin describes. I can't tell you how many times folks, uh, family members who were sitting in on these interviews would say, I didn't know that, Grandma. All the time, all the time. Um, but there definitely are, without getting too much into the weeds, because I do fear Gabriel's mighty hook, uh, there, there definitely are absolute patterns across many slash most slash dang near all of the families that I got to spend time with. Okay, do we have time for his last last? No, we're out, we're out. But we, um, they, all of the, uh, the photographers will be signing their books outside, so please, please do ask them any last questions yeah, you might have Let's give a round there. of applause for all of our panelists. Martin Scholler, Jonathan Alperi, Bia Van Cees, and Jacqueline Martin.